Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. And today I'm back in my living room in Bolton Hill, really for two reasons. One is we're gonna talk about the Bar Library and it's on the uh, fifth floor of the Clarence Mitchell Courthouse. You can't see it from the outside and I can't get in because of the coronavirus. And the second is it's really terrible weather outside. So I'm kind of happy to be inside uh, here in my living room. It also means that my daughter Leah is back as my film crew. She's working this uh, summer as a lifeguard and the pool is closed. So uh, thanks again, Leah. All right, we're gonna, uh, and you might notice also that I'm wearing a bow tie. Um, I thought that we're gonna talk about old lawyers today and I thought I'd dress as one. I don't have a seersucker suit and I don't have a pocket watch with a gold chain. Um, so this bow tie will have to do. All right, the Baltimore Bar Library. It was founded in 1840. Um, in 1840, for a little perspective, Baltimore was 100,000 people, um, and we were an up-and-coming city, the third biggest in the country. Um, we were at the confluence of our port, the harbor, uh, the B&O Railroad, and the National Road. So we really had a lot going on uh, connecting us to the rest of America and to the world. Um, at that time, uh, Baltimore had 200 lawyers, which at first I thought sounded like a lot, but maybe as an up-and-coming city, 200 with a population of 100,000 wasn't, wasn't really too many. Um, and, uh, and lawyers in that time, of course, didn't have telephones. They didn't even have typewriters. Um, so they met in person and they wrote everything out. And in fact, as a little aside, um, when they wrote out their court filings, they put them in green bags with red ribbons tied around the top. Um, and things must have been as slow and convoluted back then as they were today, because that red ribbon is where we get the term for red tape. Um, so thank you, lawyers, for that. Um, all right, to the law library. We, 1840, a young lawyer named George Brown decides that, uh, that maybe books are too expensive to buy for himself, that lawyers should share books, that we needed a library. He had library in his veins. Both his grandfather on his mother's side and his father's side were founding members uh, of Baltimore's first library in the 1790s. It was a subscription-based library, so to borrow books you had to pay. Um, for those of you who are wondering where the Pratt comes in, that wasn't until 90 years later when Enoch Pratt gives his gift that we can have a free lending library for everybody. Before then, you had to be uh, pretty much wealthy to borrow books. And so he's got library in his veins and he is passionate about starting the Baltimore Bar Library. Um, we know this because the first meeting he had in uh, 1840, um, the minutes were taken meticulously in this leather-bound journal that's still at the Bar Library. So you can go uh, read for yourself what he was uh, doing at that time. Um, and the uh, library gets started. Its first uh, chairman was a gentleman named John McMahon. And McMahon was really a, a, an exceptional individual. He was born in Cumberland. At age 17, he graduates first in his class from Princeton. At age 19, he passes the bar. At age 21, he's elected to the General Assembly. And then he moves to uh, Baltimore, where his star sort of fades a little bit. The snobby Baltimore lawyers uh, think that he is too roughly dressed and his uh, boisterous attitude is too sort of backwoodsy. So he doesn't get any clients. He moves back to Cumberland, um, but he's still a member of the General Assembly. So he goes down to Annapolis and finds himself elected as Speaker of the House. And this is at age like 25 or something. Um, he is a progressive member. He champions something called the Jew Bill, uh, which for the first time allowed Jewish men in Maryland to vote and to own property. So that was good for the day. Um, he comes back to Baltimore and his star arises again, his second time around. He uh, picks up an important client, the B&O Railroad. And in fact, he drafts the corporate charter for the B&O, which is pretty cool. Um, but what's even cooler is that's the first corporate charter in America. Nothing like that had ever been done before. So all of the uh, corporations that have their charters uh, from then on out uh, owe it back to uh, John McMahon in the B&O. And in fact, if anybody knows Bill Gates, uh, please invite him over. We'll do a little tour and we can find out, find out the history of how Microsoft Incorporated uh, got to be. That would be a fun uh, little tour. All right. Uh, McMahon goes on to be the chief uh, uh, keynote speaker in the uh, nomination for William Henry Harrison, the Whig Party. Uh, to a crowd of 20,000, he delivers, delivers a stunning speech. 
um, and gets all sorts of job offers that he turns down. He turns down being nominated to the Senate, U.S. Senate. He turns down uh, a cabinet position. Harrison says you can have any position you want. He turns him down. He even turns down a, a position being offered as the Chief Justice of the Maryland Court of Appeals. I guess he really liked being a lawyer. Good for him. Um, unfortunately, he ends, uh, he develops, uh, he goes blind. He develops a disease and goes blind. And the last 20 years of his life, he has resigned from the bar. Um, it sort of fades from history. All right, what happens to George Brown, the young ardent uh, library supporter? Um, he goes on to become mayor of Baltimore, and in fact is, in, is mayor in 1861 when the first bloodshed of the Civil War happens, when Union troops are marching uh, along Pratt Street um, and are attacked by a Southern sympathizing mob. Brown tries to quell the, the riot uh, by marching at the head of the Union troops um, and, and does eventually does uh, quell it. Um, he, however, though, gets arrested during the Civil War by President Lincoln's army, put in Fort McHenry and later a uh, jail in Boston to keep him away from his hometown of Baltimore. Um, one other gentleman, George Washington Dobbin, um, was the secretary who wrote the minutes at that first library meeting. Um, he goes on to build a house in Relay, Maryland, just south of Baltimore, um, uh, called The Lawn. A bunch of his lawyer friends think that it's a really pretty area, and they build houses there too. Um, uh, and it becomes known as Lawyer's Hill. And if you're from Relay, uh, you'll know that moniker still sticks. All right, let's get on to the Bar Library. The first library was on the second floor of the old courthouse before the Clarence Mitchell Courthouse. Here is what the editor of, um, of the Maryland Bar Journal said at the time. Uh, perched up on the top floor of, a, of the courthouse is our apology for a law library, and one visit will dissipate all doubts as to the necessity for a change. He goes on to say, then again, ventilation seems not to have been considered by the builders of our halls of justice. In summer, the place is intensely warm and in winter, exceedingly cold. So maybe luckily for the uh, bar library, we got a new courthouse in 1900 and they got a new library room or set of rooms, um, which are fantastic. If you haven't been, uh, you need to uh, find a way to go. Let me read to you a few of the things and wrapping up uh, a few of the characteristics. It's 125 feet long by 35 feet wide. It's got English oak paneling up to a height of 15 feet. Um, it's got Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, perched above the two main doorways. It's got walnut reading tables along the walls, um, and it's got a wonderful series of medallions that are actually the trademarks of early printers from Europe, beginning in the 1400s, around the time of Gutenberg. Nobody's exactly sure uh, why there are printer trademarks from old Europe uh, up there, but there they are. Um, and it's got a pretty good uh, archive collection, including a book by a gentleman, let me get this right, Nicholas Stratham. Um, he wrote The Abridgment of Cases in 1490. Um, and the Bar Library has a copy of this. It is the first law uh, printed law, bro law book in history. All right, I'll wrap up and just say the next time you're on jury duty, uh, when we do that again, um, take a short lunch hour and make a point to go up to the fifth floor of the Mitchell uh, Law uh, Mitchell Courthouse uh, and take a look at this fantastic space. And I'm going to conclude just by saying thank you to the current director, a gentleman named Joe Bennett, um, who has very kindly shared information on the li law library with us, um, as well as hosted us on tours. So thanks, Joe. And for everybody, we'll see you next time.